Wouldn't it be great if all you needed to achieve your goals in life was to take a ring of gold or silver, maybe with a gem or two set in it, and place it around your finger? That's long been the easy allure of magic rings, which have existed, or purported to have existed, throughout history. These days, when you think of magic rings, your initial thoughts probably lean toward the Lord of the Rings. J.R.R. Tolkien's legendary fantasy saga has inspired countless works in the 70 years since it was first published, many of which have included magic rings among their treasures. But what inspired Tolkien? Specifically, what inspired the central piece of his mythology, the One Ring? And where do magic rings come from in general? How long have people looked to simple bands of metal to provide them with special powers? The precise answer, as with many such things, is lost to the mists of history. As is the case with other magic objects like wands, we'll never know for sure who the first person was to promote a ring as having magical powers. But we can look at the historical and literary records to find many cases of rings being touted as magical to give us an idea of their long legacy in myth and reality. Tales of magical rings date back to antiquity. In a non-canonical text, the Bible's King Solomon supposedly had a magic ring granted to him by the Archangel Gabriel that let him control demons, whom he commanded to help him build his famous temple. Plato's Republic, written around 375 BC, includes a parable about the Ring of Gyges, which confers invisibility on its wearer. Would a person with such power be compelled to use it for evil, Plato wondered? The character who discovers the ring, a shepherd named Gyges, is sent to the court of the King of Lydia to submit his and his fellow shepherd's monthly report. Upon reaching the court, he uses the ring to become invisible and... As soon as he arrived, he seduced the queen and with her help conspired against the king and slew him and took the kingdom. If there was a moral test to be had, Gyges, much like the Balrog of Moria, did not pass. Speaking of the Lord of the Rings, there have been a number of magic rings from art and literature that Tolkien is thought to have used as the basis for the One Ring. One is Richard Wagner's opera series Der Ring des Nibelungen, though Tolkien himself disputed this link, telling his publisher that, when comparing Wagner's ring and his, both rings were round, and there the resemblance ceases. Tolkien and Wagner alike were probably influenced by magic rings in Norse mythology, most notably Anvaranat from the Volsunga saga, which was written down in the 13th century but is likely much older. This ring finds its way through many owners before landing with the serpent slash dragon Fafnir. It can find gold, though it carries with it a curse to bring misfortune to its wearer. Both of these elements, multiple owners and a curse of misfortune, can be found in both Tolkien's and Wagner's rings. Another magic ring from Norse mythology is Dropnir, which was worn by Odin and duplicated itself eight times every ninth night. But you don't need myths or fairy tales or moral proverbs to find magic rings. Plenty of real rings were considered magical in their times. As with many kinds of quick cures in recent history, wonder drugs, crystals, fad diets, and so on, magic rings were long peddled as an easy remedy for whatever problems you had or might have in the future. Why work to achieve your goals when, for just a few coins, paid to me, your trustworthy sorcerer, of course, you can put a ring on your finger and all your problems will be solved. It's a tradition that still lives on today, as I found plenty of purportedly real magic rings for sale while browsing Etsy. One out of side note on Etsy policy regarding magic rituals, and it makes me wonder what kind of lawyer was needed to draft that. Many magic rings were used for medical purposes, such as toadstone rings, which were touted as curing a number of ailments, like insect stings or venomous bites. That's because toads were thought to have a stone in their heads that counteracted the poisonous nature of their own flesh. Pliny the Elder was the first to record such a use for toadstones in the first century AD, and it was carried on at least into the time of William Shakespeare, who wrote about them in a play in 1599. In a similar vein were magic rings that, rather than curing you of a problem, tried to prevent it in the first place. An Egyptian gold ring engraved with two cockatrices was meant to be worn on the thumb and protected against the evil eye. This ring was one of nearly 250 owned by a lord and lady Lundesboro, who commissioned a book describing their collection in 1853. Another ring in that set was engraved with an image of St. Christopher and warded against sudden death, particularly drowning, while yet another thumb ring was engraved with the image of a panther gazing into a mirror and had set into it a triangular ruby on a square stone, the latter of which had been lost. It was engraved with a word that supposedly protected against epileptic seizures. There are also the Bremen, Moore, and Kingmore rings, two of many Anglo-Saxon rings discovered throughout England. They date to the late 9th century, and each bear a nearly identical inscription 30 runes in length that may have protected against bleeding. As a side note, the Kingmore ring is smaller than the Brahmin ring, and has its last three runes inscribed on the inside surface of the ring. This has led people to think that Kingmore copied the text from Brahmin, 
but the writer ran out of space on the smaller ring. Maybe he should have used a different font. By this point, you're probably thinking, all these magic rings sound great. How do I get one? Okay, if you've got two brain cells to rub together, you're probably not thinking that. And if you are, you're probably thinking you'd rather go the easy route and just buy one off the internet, Etsy policies be damned. But maybe you're the industrious sort and would rather make one yourself. If that's the case, you're in luck because there are plenty of instructions out there. You won't need a wizard, though you might need to get your hands dirty. With blood. While most online searches for Create Magic Ring will yield simple arts and crafts projects with no intention for the final product to house mystical powers, folks used to take these matters much more seriously. The Treasure of Alexander was written by an Arabic author in the 10th century AD and, in proper astrological tradition, gives detailed instructions for creating magic rings based on heavenly bodies. These rings serve dual purposes, one related to health and one that will boost your status. The owner of the Ring of Saturn will, quote, cause his enemies to fear him and he will be respected by the populace, while one who owns the Ring of Jupiter, quote, will be victorious in his disputes and his endeavors will be fruitful. Maybe you're a little more humble and just want your garden to prosper. Then the Ring of the Moon will be right for you, and as a bonus, it will also protect you while traveling. To create it, you simply make this ring of one ounce pure silver when the moon enters the third degree of Taurus when she is applying it to a sextile or trine of Venus and is more than 60 degrees distant from the sun. The signet should be circular and inscribed with the image of a crowned man holding a spear in his right and a string knotted 30 times, such as those that are used for measuring in his left hand, riding a chariot drawn by four horses. Another Arabic book of magic and astrology, known as the Gayat al-Hakim, was written in the 10th or 11th century. It was translated into Spanish and given the Latin name Picatrix in the 13th century by courtiers of Alfonso X of Castile, who also translated books about games that I talked about in my video on dice. The Picatrix provides instructions on how to make stones that, when set in rings, will ward off beetles, snakes, flies, and other pests. Other rings will make you rich, save you from assassination, and avoid unwanted pregnancies. I wonder what Etsy's return policy would look like for those kinds of rings. But the craziest instructions I've found for how to make a magic ring come from the Greek Magical Papyri, a compilation of texts produced between the 1st century BC and the 5th century AD. They include instructions for casting hundreds of spells and a few rituals for creating magic rings and amulets. Here's how you consecrate one such ring. Making a pit in a holy place open to the sky, or in a clean, sanctified tomb looking toward the east and making over the pit an altar of wood from fruit trees, sacrifice an all-white goose with no flecks of color, and three roosters and three pigeons. Make these whole burnt offerings and burn, with the birds, all sorts of incense. Then, standing by the pit, look to the east and, pouring on a libation of wine, honey, milk, and saffron, and holding over the smoke while you pray, in which are engraved the inscriptions, say... I won't go over the entire incantation, which would probably take another five minutes to read in full. But, if you follow these instructions precisely, you'll have a ring that is useful for every magical operation, and you will succeed in everything you wish. Seems worth the trouble, right? Sadly though, magic rings aren't real. Or are they? In my research, I came across a ring that was made sometime between 1200 and 1400, and was discovered in 1947 near what was once the medieval walls of the Swedish city of Visby. It has the usual hallmarks of a magic ring, a gold band and setting, a large gem, a sapphire in this case, and an inscription that reads in part that it will counteract poison. Whether it ever did that is dubious, of course, but its conspicuous opulence might have been enough to open doors for its wearer and help him achieve his ambitions. The author of the article about the ring, Luis Martinez, calls it a charismatic object that, as it was, passed from generation to generation, accumulating stories, lore, and new meanings, it would have been endowed with even greater charisma. The magic rings from the treasure of Alexander said that their wearers would be respected by the populace and that their endeavors will be fruitful. Maybe the Visby ring and other ostentatious rings like it actually fulfilled those promises in their own ways. Going back to the Lundisborough collection, the author of the catalog that described them, Thomas Croft and Croker, addressed its prologue to Lady Lundisborough and ended it by extolling the virtues of the plain gold ring she wore calling it a gift far more precious than the most costly tier of diamonds. He closed his message with a descriptive poem snippet, Sacred Vows for Life, To Love the Fair, The Angel Wife. There's a kind of magic bound up in that ring, isn't there? Oh, wait a second. Did he call the plain gold ring precious?
Thank you so much for watching this video about magic rings, and I hope it's given you some appreciation for the long history behind these simple trinkets and what they've been used for throughout the ages. Feel free to leave a comment and to let me know what you thought about it, or to suggest a topic for a future video, and like and subscribe if you want to learn more about the real history of fantasy. Until next time, may all your fancy jewelry keep you safe from assassination plots.